Okay, recording started. So I think we can start. It's a great pleasure to have today with us uh, Gilberto Colangelo, who's uh, a professor at the Institute for Theoretical Physics of the University of Bern, and uh, he's an expert in many aspects of Hadron physics, including his topic today, which is the hadronic contributions to the muon G minus two. So Gilberto, please, if you can share your slides again. That's it. Give you the virtual floor. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Carlos and uh, Gregorio, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, to visit you virtually. And uh, yes, I will give a review of uh, the standard model calculation of G minus two, in fact, mainly of um, the hadronic contributions. So here's the outline and uh, very simple after an introduction, I will come to the main two contributions which generate most of the uncertainty, hadronic vacuum polarization, hadronic light by light. And finally present the conclusions and an outlook for future developments. So here is a plot of the experimental uh, history and development uh, in the measurements of uh, um, a mu, the normal magnetic moment of the muon, and you see the unusual scale nowadays of 10 to the 3 times a mu. You're probably used to see 10 to the 10 times a mu, but this is to show a couple of things. First, how uh, slowly it uh, it improved, uh, slowly the measurements improved at the beginning. So you see the first error bar, which are huge, then the second significant reduction, and then we come sort of into the modern era with the final uh, measurement at almost 1980 of the CERN experiment. Then there were almost 20 years of interruption with no measurement when the, the Brookhaven measurement was, was planned and then built. And here in this uh, zoomed in part, you see the, the development of uh, the Brookhaven experiment with the, with the various measurement carried out over the years uh, there. With this uh, red point here showing the world average, which uh, was actual until about a month ago. Now with this scale, I can show you another thing from, from the theoretical side. First of all, this uh, magenta dot here, that's the value of the electron G minus two, which you see is significantly smaller than the muon G minus two. Now, most of the difference uh, between electron and muon, what you can see on this scale here, is due to QED. In fact, if you just uh, use QED to calculate, so forget about the rest of the interactions in the standard model. So this is what you get for the electron. And this uh, uh, downward triangle gives you the, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon in QED. Now if then zoomed in uh, part, you see that this is very far from the actual measurement. So to uh, understand this, let's go first of all to the, to the number, to the Brookhaven final result, which was the world average until a month ago. And as I showed you on the plot, uh, the bulk of the difference between the electron and the muon is due to QED. And it's, it's very large, uh, seen on that large scale. And it, it, it's due to large logs of uh, the ratio of the two masses. Now, the experimental value of a mu and the QED value also differs substantially. Mm -hmm. 
7,000, about 7,000, 10 to the minus 11. And the reason is understood, it's due to hadronic contributions, which, well, from this rough estimate, you expect, or from this comparison, you expect to be of the order of 7,000. And indeed, you can make a, a, a very quick and dirty calculation of hadronic vacuum polarization, and you realize that it's something like that. And so at the end of the CERN experiment, that was seen already, already with more than five sigma. And, and what, what remains to, to be added in the standard model is electroweak contributions. And uh, these are now known and calculated to two loop, and they are about 150, 10 to the minus 11, which means 2.5 of the experimental uncertainty of the Brookhaven experiment. Fast forward to today, that was the BNL result, uh, the Fermilab result, you all know already, they are very well compatible. The Fermilab uh, uncertainty is a little smaller and it's when you combine the two that it gets reduced um, with this, with the average shown here. And here's a graphic comparison to the standard model prediction on which the rest of the talk uh, will, be, will be focused. And um, so you see, this is the experimental value of Brookhaven set as zero. And here are different theoretical predictions. This is the white paper, which I will introduce in a moment which is essentially based on these two different analyses of uh, hadronic vacuum polarization. Here for comparison is another one due to jaeger lena And in the upper part of the plot, two lattice results. This is the, the summary given in the white paper for the lattice situation. And this is the BMW result, which is by now, a year old, but which was published after a couple of revision, including a small shift of the number, just um, a month ago. And here, this gray band gives you the projected final Fermilab uncertainty, a factor of four reduced with respect to the Brookhaven one. Now we'll show you what happens if you include Fermilab and keep in mind that the zero will stay put at the experimental value, so all the rest will shift. So here again, the, the, the average. Now you see that the orange band is a little, is not that bigger of the gray band. So the, the orange band is now the combination of these two results. The rest is unchanged other than because we've shifted the zero. And so now because of the reduction of the orange band, uh, the difference between experiment and standard model is 4.2 sigmas. So here is a summary of what goes into the standard model calculation. And I ask you to focus at the moment in the lower part of the band. So there are these four contributions I mentioned already, QED, which is the bulk of it. Uh, hadronic contributions, this about 7,000 units, mostly hadronic vacuum polarization. Electroweak, which is 154, as mentioned. And, uh, and here you see the uncertainties. You have to watch out that they are referred to to the number on the left. And so this is uh, tiny, irrelevant. The electroweak is small and irrelevant compared to the experimental one. And the two only significant ones are the hadronic. Vacuum polarization I mentioned already is the main contribution. And nowadays is also the, the dominant contribution to the uncertainty, but there's a subleading contribution due to hadronic uh, physics, which is uh, light by light. And this is um, calculated with a data-driven approach and also lattice. 
So you combine all these together, you get this value here, and that's the difference with respect to experiment, this famous now 4.2 sigma. So the rest of the talk, as I mentioned, will be dedicated to these two. So now let's look at the upper part of the table. And uh, hadronic vacuum polarization uh, based on the calculated with a data-driven approach has been calculated at leading, next to leading, and next to next to leading order, and based on E plus E minus data. That's the main contribution. The next to leading order is negative, about two orders of magnitude um, smaller, as you would expect from alpha electromagnetic suppression. Somewhat surprisingly, uh, the NNLO is not that much suppressed with respect to NLO. That's a calculation by Matthias Steinhauser and his group in Karlsruhe. But they explained that this is due to large logs, um, again, of uh, lepton masses, of ratios of lepton masses. And now in the uh, white paper, a number of lattice calculations were considered, discussed, and uh, average, and this was the, the assessment of the situation to at about a year ago. And you see that this is compatible <clears throat> with the database evaluation, but with a much larger uncertainty, so that in the end, this was not considered in the final result. If you go now to light by light, again, with a data-driven approach, this is the number which is obtained, about 20% uncertainty, but which was hard to, to get, but it's now a factor two smaller than this one. And so subdominant. This is also known at the next to leading order. Uh, well, estimated, it's a simple estimate, but just to, to check that there are no surprises, and this is the two orders of magnitude suppression, which you would expect here. Uh, now, a year ago, there was one lattice calculation of this contribution, which agreed well with the data-driven one, but with a significantly larger uncertainty. Nonetheless, given the agreement, it was decided to uh, average the two. And this is for leading order light by light. And in the end, in the total, you have to add the small next to leading order. And so that is what, uh, what the situation is. Now, I mentioned BMW. This was, as I said, already available about a year ago. And uh, now is published. And this is their result. And the, the big... Um, Novelty here is that the, the uncertainty is finally compatible, about the same size uh, as uh, the data-driven one, but the, the central value not quite compatible, and I will come back to this. Now, let me uh, tell you what this white paper is. Uh, presumably most of you know, but this is the paper. It's a published in physics report. And this theory initiative, which involves uh, many people, the number of authors in this paper uh, exceeds 130. And uh, this initiative was sort of coordinated by this group of people here. And the activities of this uh, initiative started in uh, uh, 2017. So they went on for almost four years. And there were a number of workshops and uh, a lot of work to condense and to find consensus on the, on the final result. I told you the executive summary already, but let me go through it once again. So QED and ElectroWeek, they are known stable and the uncertainties are uh, irrelevant in, for the present discussion. Hadronic vacuum polarization dispersive, it's a consensus number, between different groups, and it's uh, the aim was to get to a uh, to get a conservative uncertainty estimate. In the white paper, you find also a consensus number for the hadronic vacuum polarization lattice, but the uncertainty is about five times larger 
than the data-driven one, so uh, not even an average was, was attempted. The new result by BMW has a central value which would reduce the discrepancy with experiment to less than two sigmas. The uncertainty is, the uncertainty is similar to the data-driven one. And uh, as you know, when you make this uh, summary, et cetera, there are also uh, rules you have to set up before you start. And one of the rules, like in flag, which Carlos knows very well, uh, is that if it's not published, it's not considered, for example, for the final average. And I must say in this case, with uh, also given the, the small shift in the final result, I think this was shown to be a wise decision. For what concerns light by light, hydraulic light by light, the dispersive, the data-driven one is again a consensus number. There are many contributions which matter and calculated by different groups. And so one had to put everything together and find agreement. And there were a number of recent improvements in the last five years, which made this one, which let's say 10 or 20 years ago was considered really the problematic contribution, make the uncertainty from this one now really subdominant with respect to, to HVP. Uh, the good news is that the, the lattice uh, also uh, produce one number for this uh, just before, just about a year ago, and uh, that this agreed, even though with a larger uncertainty, with the data-driven one. And so this was including the final average. And in the meanwhile, very recently, again, uh, a month ago, a new result appeared, which is in agreement with both. Now, the main message of this is that the uncertainty comes from hadronic physics. And let us now focus on these two contributions. So the hadronic vacuum polarization is this diagram shown here. The problem is to evaluate this hadronic blob. And the way to do it, the traditional one, is to use unitarity and analyticity. You make a cut through this blob, so all the hadrons which go here, they go on shell, and this is a virtual photon going to on shell hadron. So this is a process you can measure. And uh, it has been measured by several experiments and there is even an ongoing program for improving this measurement for further. So this is why such uh, uh, an amazing precision below 1% can be reached for a hadronic quantity. The alternative approach is now lattice, which is uh, clearly becoming competitive. And there are several groups working hard on reaching the same level of accuracy as uh, data driven or BMW. So hydronic light by light is one order higher, but uh, as I said before, was considered the problematic contribution because was uh, very uncertain and for a while calculated only with uh, models. And in fact, you could hear statements like cannot be expressed in terms of measurable quantities at conferences on this or even in papers. But recently we developed a dispersive approach which make a data-driven calculation and the systematic treatment of this contribution also possible. And this is why this was now reduced to about 20%, which makes it subdominant with respect to hadronic vacuum polarization. And lattice QCD is also becoming competitive. There's essentially two groups which have produced results, and this is MINES and RBC UK QCD. So let me now go into the details of these two contributions. So for HVP, uh, I told you already, you make a cut through this blob and then you relate the imaginary part of this quantity, which is a scalar function of just one scalar variable, the Q square of the photon. You relate this to something measurable, the cross section plus and minus two hadrons. And that's essentially the, the only input you need. If you measure this for all Q squares, then 
uh, you can calculate this uh, vertex correction with this blob exactly. And this is a formula which is known since uh, 60 years. And with this kernel function here, which is known and which goes like one over S for large S. So it tells you that contributions or cross sections at growing energy contribute less and less to the, to the integral. The important point, and that's the difference with respect to hadronic light by light, is that this kernel function is the same, no matter what kind of hadrons you have in this block, because everything depends only on one variable, on Q square, or S in this, in this formula here. And you can imagine that as you go to higher and higher energies, you can have more and more channels. So you have to sum over many exclusive channels. And this is, uh, in this table, you see the main, the most important channels, but there are several other ones. And here's a comparison of the two main uh, and complete analysis, which on which the result of the white paper is based. First of all, have a look at the total, which shows that the agreement between the two analyses is excellent. 1.2 is the difference with an uncertainty. Well, the, the, the more aggressive one twice as large. And here you see that the uncertainty is esti estimated more conservatively. However, the situation is not as good as it looks if you concentrate only on the last line, because if you go up uh, in this table, in particular, look at the pi plus pi minus, which is by far the dominant channel, you see that there's a, a difference between the two analyses, which is significantly larger than the final difference. And so this difference is then compensated by differences in the other direction, in other channels. And so in, instead of just combining the final result, the work done for the white paper was to uh, study and try to understand these differences in the individual channels. And so in particular, uh, for the two pi channel, the, an important additional input was obtained from these two other analyses, which looked at analytic properties, not of the, of the hadronic blob of the hadronic vacuum polarization, but rather of the cross section or the amplitude E plus E minus going to pi plus pi minus, which can be described by an object, which is called the vector form factor of the pion, which itself satisfies analyticity and unitarity properties. And so you can use these properties to describe this object with a parametrization which respects them. And then, so in these papers, there was an analysis of the data E plus E minus to pi plus pi minus, so those which are on the first uh, line here. And uh, in this case, so a detailed comparison of this channel, energy region by energy region, not only among these two analyses, but also with this other alternative method here was possible and was made. And so in the end, to combine this different analysis, a method was developed, which I'm describing you here uh, in this slide. So first of all, so let me mention this other uh, analytic methods used to analyze particular channels were available not for everything, but just for the two pi and three pi channels. So uh, for most of the channel is only the combination of two of them, but for some particular channel, even three. And so the, the method to combine these results was to uh, average in a simple manner to obtain central values averages the different analysis. And this was done for each channel and mass range. The largest experimental and systematic uncertainty of the two or more analysis was taken. And moreover, 
half of the difference between these two main analyses, or in the two pi channel, the main experimental input, namely Babar and Chloe, was taken and added as uh, a systematic uncertainty. So by applying this method to all the channels, the final result is shown here. And what I want to emphasize is that if you only consider experimental uncertainties, you could come up with a much smaller error. And it's because of this, so uh, a sort of a recipe which is more conservative than just the, the chi, the, the S uh, increase of the uncertainty suggested by the PVG. So because of this, that there was another 2.8 units of systematic uncertainties. And finally, in the region of transition between hadronic inputs, so exclusive channels and perturbative QCD, uh, where you may have duality violations. Uh, so there was also an additional uncertainty because of this transition region, which was uh, included. The final result is shown here with this four and 10 to the minus 10 or 40, as I showed before. Now, of course, now the, the an important issue is uh, the comparison to the lattice, to this one calculation on the lattice, which has a similar uncertainty. So the BMW is a state-of-the-art lattice calculation of this, of this quantity and is based on putting a current current correlator, evaluating this on the lattice, and you have to calculate in configuration space, then you sum over all distances, and then you integrate in time with um, sort of the analog of the K function I showed you in the dispersive integral. You have a kernel function uh, depending on time, which you have to include when, when you calculate this in configuration space. The calculation was done using staggered fermions, essentially on a six Fermi lattice, although an 11 Fermi lattice was used for studying finite volume correction. And the calculation was done at physical or close to physical quark masses so, so that the interpolation to reach the exact physical point was made and included isospin breaking effects. <clears throat> so here's summary of all the different uh, diagrams in the in a lattice sense. So you have here disconnected diagrams, for example, but you have to imagine you have gluons connecting the quarks. Everything here is in a gluon, in a gluonic uh, background. And you see that the main contribution is isospin symmetric by far dominating is the one including up and down valence quarks. There's a somewhat smaller contribution due to strange than charm and as I said, disconnect. And then a list of isospin breaking contributions, both strong and uh, electromagnetic. And they required a, a significant effort, of course, to calculate all these diagrams. But in the end, if you look at the numbers, you see that most of them are, are really small. So just to show that this is a, a complete thorough calculation. Of course, on the lattice, you have to fight against systematic effects. And one very significant one is finite size, which was a problem for, for quite a while, was uh, seen to be significant. And so one had to address it both with analytic formulae as well as numerical study. In the end, I think that BMW could um, estimate this effect uh, very well so that it did not become, did not affect the final result in the uncertainty significantly anymore. So the final result is shown here. And you see that in the end is systematic dominating. But the systematic is not due to finite size effects. I think that the main source is the continuum extrapolation, which is uh, illustrated by this plot taken from the paper which appeared in Nature. 
And here you see that uh, continuum extrapolation is done applying different correction formulas shown here. And then for after correcting for uh, analytically for uh, um, finite lattice uh, spacing dependence, then different extrapolation to the continuum limit were made. In fact, they, they did a huge number of fits and then did a statistical analysis of the results and came up main, um, based purely on statistics with this uh, purple band, but then they considered also systematic dependence and stretched it to the gray band with the final estimate of this being five units in 10 to, in 10 to the minus 10. Now, let me point out that the, if you did not apply this uh, um, analytic corrections to finite lattice spacing dependence, so the raw data, as far as uh, A dependence uh, is concerned, are shown by these green dots here. And so you see that there's uh, a strong A squared dependence, which um, if you didn't correct would certainly give you another picture. But with this uh, correction, then it's, uh, it's milder and uh, it looks under good control. Nonetheless, let me emphasize that when you see this, this plot here, uh, you don't know how much of this uh, distribution can be interpreted statistically and how much of that is systematic. So that's an issue to keep, be kept in mind. So that's a description of the calculation, but the discrepancy which is seen with, uh, with respect to the calculation based on E plus E minus data is uh, surprising and one would like to, to understand. So I will discuss this point now with a couple of slides. So if you take the BMW result at face value and so you consider that that's the true value of hadronic vacuum polarization. If you want to interpret this on a, from the data-driven point of view, which certainly theoretically has no systematic issues, then you have to conclude that somewhere the E plus E minus to hadron cross-section you have input to make the calculation is actually not the correct one. Okay. There must be a shift in this cross-section somewhere. Now, the running of alpha due to hadrons, if you run alpha from zero to mzw, mz squared, sorry, you can calculate this by doing an integral over the same cross-section. Of course, it's a different kernel function, which gives much more weight at high energy. So uh, you may have, it, they are sensitively to different, sensitive to different uh, um, energy regions, these two integrals. The point is that if you have to change the cross section to shift the value of, uh, uh, of HVP, of A mu HVP, you necessarily have to shift also this, uh, the running of alpha. The size of the shift depends on where the, the, the shift in the cross section occurs. So how much the quantitative question is, uh, is open, we don't know. But a shift has to be there. And if there's a shift, then you have an impact on the electroweak fit. Now, there have been analyses, in fact, three different ones, which have discussed this issue, even though with uh, doing some hypotheses, because you don't know what, to, what shift in the cross-section the BMW data correspond to. But anyway, the conclusion of these three different analyses is that if you want to avoid problems in the electroweak fit, then the shift in the cross-section has to occur at low energy. Uh, at most, 
up to 2 GeV, but better below 1 GeV. Because of course, the, the weight functions are different. You, you have the maximal contribution to A mu at low energy and the minimal to the running of alpha. And if you don't make this assumption, then you definitely have a problem with the electroweak fit. Now, I told you before that below 1 GeV, in particular, there's essentially one channel, which is pi plus pi minus, that this can be described by one function, the vector form factor of the pion, which uh, has to respect analyticity and unitarity. And in fact, there are explicit parameterization which implement these properties uh, automatically. And so this such a function is described in terms of a small number of parameters in such a way that analyticity and unitarity are respected automatically. And so what we have done is to analyze how these parameters could be changed so as to produce such a shift in the hadronic vacuum polarization contribution to A mu. And this is shown in the next plots. This is now the data. You see Babar, Chloe mainly, but also the, uh, the Novosibirsk data. And you see the, the black line is our central fit to this data. Okay, now we did the exercise of imposing a shift in the final integral in A mu HVP and then letting these parameters change such as to reproduce this shift. And we looked at different scenarios and one is where only the pi pi phase shift is changed or if the change could come from inelastic channels. And you see that depending on the scenarios, you, you have a larger or smaller shift. In fact, what this shows is that this, if you ask only the phase shifts to be changed, the change in the row region is too large and is essentially in flat disagreement with the data. But this one is more distributed uh, over the whole region and it looks mildly compatible with the data. Well, if you want to analyze how compatible, you see here a change in the chi-square. So here's the minimum. Uh, so it would correspond to the black line, the previous plot. And now if you uh, shift the value of a mu, that's how the chi-square changes, chi-square with respect to the data. So that's a scenario with only phase shift and that's the, the more favorable one. But you see that the increase in the chi-square is very significant if you want all the shift to be uh, generated in this region. Now, even if all the change happens at low energy, you still have a, a shift in the running of alpha. And this is shown in this plot, which in fact shows that no matter how you generate this shift, so which parameters you allow to change, you have about the same shift in the, in the running of alpha, which is relatively modest. So something more than one unit and, and a bit less than two units. But now if you look at the electroweak fit, this is already lower than what you get from this integral. And so if you now require that the value of A mu HVP increases by this about 15 units, then you see that, sorry, you see that uh, this calculation here, this value here has to increase by one and a half units. And so the discrepancy increases a little bit, not dramatically, but it definitely increases. Here now is a correlation with another quantity, which is the charge radius of the pion, which is interesting because this can be calculated on the lattice. Unfortunately, not yet with enough precision such that you could discriminate between the different scenarios and possibly test the BMW result. But this is definitely a quantity which is much easier to calculate than uh, the full hadronic vacuum polarization. So it would be interesting to look at this. And here is a plot showing the shift in the whole region after I mean, normalizing by 
the central value so that you don't have to, uh, so that the, the big peak of the row allows you, uh, uh, doesn't hide, let's say, the size of the uncertainties. And here is the, the space-like region, because here is where the lattice also can do the calculation. And from, uh, and here there are this NA7 data, but also it is at lattice results. Now, one may wonder, and definitely from this plot, you see that there are some data which are somewhat higher than the central fit. And this is known, these are Babar, and the Chloe data, which are somewhat lower than the total fit. So it's interesting to look at, the, and at what you get if you analyze individually the different data sets. And this is shown in this plot. So this is the final result by doing this fit. And let me emphasize, this is the contribution from be below one GeV. So it's not the total, not even four pi pi the total. And so you see that if you look at the individual data sets, the results scatter a little bit and Baba is uh, uh, larger than the central value, whereas Chloe is a bit lower. Now we cannot directly compare lattice to this one because there's no way for the lattice to stop at one GeV. It's never done in the time-like region. But we have assumed in doing the analysis so far that all the change happens below one GeV. So what I can do to compare to lattice result is just to subtract everything else, which is not pi pi below one GeV, calculated with the data-driven approach. So if you want, this is an arbitrary subtraction, but this is the number you have to add to the contribution below one GV to get to the total. So if I subtract this to the BMW result or to the white paper lattice result, this is what I get. So you see that BMW touches with the error band of Babar is definitely on the right hand side as also the the white paper lattice result. Now there's an important information. I mean, BMW doesn't tell us where this change comes from, but what they did is to show this quantity, which is not the physical quantity, is a lattice defined quantity, which is the window quantity. I told you, you have to do an integral over time in the end when you do the calculation on the lattice. And so instead of integrating with weight function one over all time, you can decide to, to split the integral into three contributions. And the red line has a contribution mostly from short time, so it's called short distance. The black line is the window quantity, it is in the middle, so you remove short and large distance. And then you have the large distance window, and this has a lot of noise problems whereas the short distance is more sensitive to the continuum extrapolation. Now, the interesting point is that you can translate uh, these uh, weight function into weight function in S. So it, it means you can use these weight functions when you do the data-driven calculation and compare. So let me go back to this plot this is the result of BMW for this window quantity. And these are two other lattice results, which have similar precision if you concentrate on this window quantity, because this window quantity is easier to calculate. You remove noise at long distance, the need for uh, an accurate uh, uh, continuum extrapolation. Also, this is in the isospin limit, et cetera. And using these weight functions, you can now calculate the same quantity with input from data, from E plus E minus data. And you see that it's slower. So there's a significant difference between lattice and data-driven also for this quantity. Now, this tells us, if you consider these weights here, that actually the hypothesis that all the change comes from below one GeV is not compatible with this discrepancy here. Because if you put all the weight below one GeV, it 
it contributes to this window quantity. You have to weight it with this function here, only just a little. So it cannot explain this difference here. So you have to reduce a little, uh, I mean, how much comes from below one Jeff. And in the end, by analyzing the situation with Martin Hoferichter and Peter Stoffer, we concluded that in fact, at least about five in 10 to the minus 10 must come from above one GV. And so instead of shifting the, the BMW result by 197.7, which is the contribution in the data-driven approach, which comes from above GV, I have to subtract something smaller than that by at least five units. If I do that, BMW sh gets shifted to the left and it becomes much more compatible with Babar. And in the end, if you look at the whole picture, not in such a significant discrepancy with all the others also. But then the problem is what happens with the discrepancy above one GV and this, this will have more impact on the electroweak fit and so on. So this is uh, the current status and definitely these window quantities, also the other two are important tools to understand this discrepancy better. Okay, let me come to hadronic light by light. I hope I have 10 more minutes, Carlos. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, this will be faster, but uh, still. So here the situation is, is complicated. And as I told you already, for a long time, this was calculated with models and people thought not possible to relate it to measurable quantities. And also on the lattice is definitely more complicated. And so people started earlier doing HVP calculation than light by light, but now also on this lattice is making fast progress. Now, in our group in Bern, we're the first to show that, in fact, you can express the contribution of light by light as an integral, now a triple integral. So that's the analogous of the single integral for HVP. But now you need the triple integral. Here again, you have kernel functions which are known analytically. And instead of the single function, which is relevant for hadronic vacuum polarization, you have a number of them. In the end, what counts is 12 linear combination of the 54 which are necessary to describe this tensor completely. And part of, of the work was to show that you can define this decomposition of this tensor in terms of these 54 different structures in such a way that these functions appearing here are free of kinematic singularities so that you can describe them dispersively. And then unitarity tells you how these quantities are related to sub amplitudes, which can be measured elsewhere. So they are measurable sub processes. Now, in contrast to the case of hadronic vacuum polarization, you see that there are, there's a more complicated um, dependence of the integrand on the integration variables. And so in particular, there are different contributions, different immediate states, which contribute to different of these different functions, scalar functions appearing here. So it's not just one integral and you insert the imaginary part and you have everything. For each channel, you have a different integral in this case. But so we did the analysis channel by channel. And in particular, the most important one is the pi on pole. Then you have to cut through this hadronic blob in this four point function. You require that there is a single pole in the middle and then you relate the imaginary part to the sub amplitude, which is the pi on transition form factor. Now the pi on transition form factor has been analyzed dispersively. So this sub amplitude is known quite well. In fact, this one has been calculated also on the lattice in the Mainz group, and the two results are in very good agreement. So this is something you can calculate in this way. You can go beyond 
the single pion and also look at the two pion intermediate state. And in particular, first, uh, first focus on a part of this subamplitude, which is due to again having a pole, a pion pole in the T channel in the subamplitude. So this contribution defined in this way is what we call the pion box. And you see that if you cut through these lines and impose that you have a pion pole, you are essentially putting the pion on shell everywhere. And so everything which remains as hadronic input quantity is the same which we have seen before, one uh, virtual photon going to two pions. So that's the vector form factor of the pion. And in fact, we were able to show rigorously as a mathematically exact result that this object here defined dispersively as I told you is nothing but three times the pion vector form factor times the scalar QED amplitude. So all you need to know to calculate this object without approximations is the vector form factor of the pion, which is already very well known. Then you can do again a cut through two pion lines and here don't require anything anymore. You have subtracted the pole, the rest you can expand in, uh, uh, in partial waves. And so you, you can calculate this contribution integrating over the different partial waves. And then everything else we have uh, sort of taken aside, it will be included, but not with the same level of rigor, but just you, you have then to look at different resonances and how they contribute here. For all the rest, in principle, there's an exact treatment as good as the one which gives you the, the HVP contribution in terms of an impure. There's another important point here, which is known in the literature since a long time, which has been discussed also at length, namely short distance constraints. So what is the short distance behavior of the whole object, the, the whole uh, four uh, point um, green function of the electromagnetic current. And this has been analyzed by Melnick of Weinstein and then more recently by Benens and his group. And uh, there are two different regimes, one where all momenta are large and then the limit for large momenta looks like this to leading order. And then the famous Mannikov-Weinstein limit where you take only two large momenta much larger than the third one. In fact, in this case, because of non-renormalization theorem which concern the, the axial anomaly, Melnick of Weinstein showed that in the chiral and large and C limit, this behavior here is exact. There are no corrections. Okay, and now if you look at the individual contributions which I discussed so far, you can easily um, find out that none of these individual contributions satisfies these constraints. So you have to do something. And for many years, there was essentially only one possible solution to this short distance constraints, which is the one originally proposed by Melnick of Weinstein. So they proposed a modification of the pion pole. Uh, recently, we have studied, we have made regge models of pseudoscalars, which uh, so by resumming a tower of pseudoscalars like the pion, say excited states, you can satisfy this constraint. You impose that the resummation gives you this constraint or satisfies this constraint, which no individual pole contribution can satisfy. And with a holographic QCD model, these two groups have shown that with again a resummation but of axial resonances, you can satisfy these constraints. Now numerical analysis shows that uh, the Melnick of Weinstein model significantly gives you a significantly larger contribution that, than the other two, which in fact agree quite well, despite the fact that they are based on different sets of uh, different kinds of hadrons to, to satisfy, 
to be resumed and to satisfy these constraints. In fact, even more recently, a fourth approach has been developed, which is sort of agnostic about which kind of uh, uh, hadronic states are responsible for this matching to the high to the high energy regime. This was developed by Lutke and Procura. And uh, the numerical estimate they give is in very good agreement with this one. And this is well illustrated by this plot. If you, in the integral I showed you before in this triple integral, if you put a cutoff at the lower end, called this Q min, okay, and uh, use these different models to, to calculate the contribution to A mu, you see that uh, the one based on axials, they vary a little bit, but agree well with the one based on pseudoscalars and disagree with uh, melnikov weinstein although in the end, they all satisfy the same constraints. And this is what happens if you extrapolate just the quark loop, which is what gives you this limit to low energy, you would get something much larger. Anyway, let me come now to the summary table for this result. And what I want to emphasize is that with this uh, dispersive method, there are channels which you can analyze rigorously. And so these are the first three lines, uh, three rows in this table. And if you compare to previous results, you see that there's been a huge improvement and a very significant reduction in the uncertainty. So that if you compare only at this level, you see that there's almost an order of magnitude reduction in the uncertainty. And this is now not based on approximation, really based on uh, a rigorous approach. There are contributions which are come from higher up in energy, intermediate states which have higher masses, which are more difficult to estimate and for which we could not yet apply the same level of rigor as this. And these are essentially the only one responsible for the final uncertainty. In fact, the final uncertainty here is obtained by summing linearly, which you can view as overly conservative, but by summing linearly the uncertainties, which have been estimated already conservatively here. And so, because we were uh, so overly conservative here, if you look at the final result the, and compare to previous ones, you don't get the impression that there was that much progress as you can see in the first row. And here now is a comparison of uh, the data-driven dispersive with the lattice result by RBC UK QCD. You see that their uncertainty is significantly larger. And now the very recent result by Mainz has an uncertainty which is comparable, in fact, smaller than this one, but there's very good agreement between the three and here for historical reason, the previous ones. So I'm already at my, or not already, but I'm at my conclusions. So I showed you, I discussed what goes into the present standard model evaluation of the anomalous magnetic moment of the, the muon. The, main contribution to the uncertainty is due to hadronic vacuum polarization. And here we have the problem that the lattice, the, the only lattice calculation with uh, a similarly small uncertainty uh, does not quite agree with E plus C minus data. And uh, of course, if that was the final answer, then the discrepancy with uh, this experiment would be below two sigma. I showed you that for hadronic light by light contribution, this new approach which has been developed has allowed us to bring down the accuracy, even though estimating this very conservatively, conservatively to below 20%. And two recent lattice calculations agree with this estimate. Finally, the outlook, you know that the final goal of the Fermilab experiment is to reduce the uncertainty of the previous experiment by a factor four. So we could 
easily reach if central value stays uh, put seven sigma discrepancy. So this is very important. Now, one needs to make progress also on the theory side to match this kind of uh, small uncertainty. On the HVP side, data-driven approach, there are more experiments coming up. In fact, SND has released results last year, BES3 also. There's another experiment from Novosibirsk, which has is analyzing data. And Babar also has uh, is working on uh, analysis of new data. And so we'll come up at some point with, uh, with another data set. And so it is possible to have further error reductions. On the lattice side, I mentioned there are several other groups working and aiming at reaching the same level of precision as BMW. And here is important that this result is either confirmed or refuted by others. And in particular, the discrepancy with the data-driven approach has to be understood. On the hadronic light by light side, I think that the goal of a 10% uncertainty is within reach. This lower part of the table improvements are possible and the, and the uncertainty had been estimated conservatively. So, and on the lattice side, there's already, uh, the two results are already very good and RBC Q UK QCD will definitely work towards reaching a similar position as mines. And in this case, it looks like it will be possible to combine the data driven and the lattice to have an even more precise result. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Gilberto, for the, for the excellent review. Um, time for questions. There is one by Alvaro. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you very Hi. much for an extremely clear and complete review of the situation. There's one thing that hasn't changed over the times and has always been, in my opinion, a serious problem. And that is that the E plus, E minus annihilation experiments do not agree with each other. So what one does is one looks at the PDG uh, for what to do in such a case, and they have some prescription, which you improve by making it uh, even more open. But this prescription is, is a diplomatic prescription in order to have people who disagree seem to agree. It is not seriously ma serious mathematics or statistics or physics or anything. It's just diplomacy, in my opinion. So up to the day when the experiments on E plus E minus annihilations uh, decide to agree with very precise data, um, it's a bit too early to write 100 or 200 papers on physics beyond the standard model. That's my opinion. Yes, it's definitely a legitimate point of view. Um, I mean, that's the situation. And it's clear that the two most precise experiments sort of disagree with each other by more than their uh, claimed uncertainties. Yeah, and one can decide how to describe the situation, but yeah, the fact the numbers I think are laid uh, down open for everybody. Thanks. Uh, I have a question on, if I, if I may. I... Sure, go on, Gregorio. Yeah. That... Have... Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So my connection is not very good. So it's precisely on this plot. So uh, Gilberto, you mentioned that there is a, a 5, 10 to the minus 10 extra correction when um, bringing lattice data into this plot. So um, the, the, upper, the upper part should also have that. 5, 10 to the minus 10, right, in principle? No, no, no. I <clears throat> So this shift is based on this result, on this discrepancy. 
since I don't know what is the value of the window quantity for this number here, I cannot apply the shift. Anyway, it's irrelevant. For this case, it would be irrelevant. Yes. So, so can you tell again, what is the fact that I understand then? So in the analysis I described here, okay, with all this shift, I have assumed that everything, all the difference, okay, between BMW and the data-driven happens below one GV. Now I can calculate the window quantity uh, based on data, only plus or minus data. And if I assume that the difference is all coming from between threshold and one GV, then you see that these three curves gives you the weight, how much of that discrepancy goes into each of the windows. So by integrating the, the difference with this weight, with this line here, I get a contribution to this. And that cannot explain this difference. Okay, so I have now put all the difference below one GV and I find out that it cannot explain this difference. So the only way out is I, I take out some of this discrepancy from below one GV and I put it somewhere else higher up in energy. But now if I reduce the discrepancy below one GV, I get even less contribution to this window from below one GV. So it's sort of an iterative process. I have to try to find a point of equilibrium, okay? And our conclusion, which is not, um, say, a theorem, but if you assume that nothing crazy happens, that this discrepancy is uh, a mild function, a flat function, and you just play with these weight functions, you conclude that at least five, 10 to the minus 10 must come from above one GV. And the difference, you know, is, uh, how is it, about, well. Around eight, right? No, 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 fifth, almost 15. Yes, 15, yeah, I was subtracting the, the five, so yeah, 15 in depth. Yeah, it's 14.4, it's yeah. So about nine may come from below one GV and about five has to come from above. And so they will, for example, enter with some more weights in the running of alpha, for example. Okay, so do we know something already about these other window quantities in the low, uh, short distance and long distance part? I mean, direct no. comparison, not yet, right? No, so I guess you were at the HVP workshop in November and that was discussed. And I think in the uh, summary talk, Hartmut uh, insisted that these are important quantities and that uh, future lattice calculations of this have to, if possible, provide numbers for each of these individual windows. I think that's very important to understand the discrepancy with the plus or minus data. I agree. Um, there was another question waiting from Giancarlo. Hi, Gilberto. Thanks for the very nice uh, uh, seminar. Um, I have uh, more than one question on the Latin, on the hadronic vacuum polarization. The first is uh, I would like to know your reaction when you have seen uh, your BMW. Would you have expected uh, such a discrepancy? If such a discrepancy would have come from there? 
second is uh, is that possible that uh, the precision required for the other vacuum polarization and for the dispersive uh, uh, calculation is so uh, important that uh, uh, we cannot really arrive to that precision and also regarding the uh, bmw uh, result uh, i was reading that uh, they use uh, if it's correct if i understood correctly they have used a very powerful computer so to uh, to have a very uh, small uh, statistical error and if these uh, uh, you can see that comparing to the other uh, lattice result okay so this is uh, my summary of the my many questions on this uh, result yeah I, first one I, I don't think is interesting at all what i what i thought so <laughs> let me skip that one um, And then, I mean, definitely they have used, I think, many more core hours than anybody else. That's for sure. Um, in the end, I think if there's one point which needs to be understood better in this lattice calculation is the continuum extrapolation. You know, that's what they see. That's the A squared dependence they see. But to make the extrapolation, they first have to do this analytic correction. And this analytic correction, you see rho here is a staggered, it's because you have to take into account taste breaking, which is um, a finite lattice spacing effect. But Usually, in many cases, you can do this with chiral perturbation theory, which gives you a, a solid framework in which to take this into account. Here, for this quantity, is not only short this sorry long distance is not only low energy which matters is a quantity which involves a different uh, uh, regimes in energy, and so to make this correction, there is a model in the end, which is very reasonable because most of the physics here is related to the row. And so you have to uh, describe how the row couples to the different tastes, to the different pions, etc. It's very reasonable, but still the step from here to here, which is essential, you have to do by modeling the situation. And definitely one needs to understand this better, I think. And it's important, it would be very important that other groups with different discretizations do a similar analysis. And this is also one reason why the window quantity is important because uh, this window quantity is easier to calculate and there are more groups which can compare. And what you can conclude at this survey is that there's not only a discrepancy between this calculation and the data, but there is a discrepancy between two different lattice calculations for the same quantity, two different lattice calculations which claim the same kind of accuracy. Now, maybe I missed one question, so please remind me which one it was. No, uh, is on the dispersive calculation of the hadronic vacuum polarization, the error uh, achieved is very small, okay? So actually I saw some 0.7 for duality violation. So my question is how tested is the precision required, like the one that uh, you assume for the dispersive calculation, maybe the, the error is larger, is uh, this is uh, the, uh, the most precise calculation that uh, one has done. So maybe there is a systematic that we didn't take into account, something like that. How test has been? Is that yeah. clear? So I'm definitely not an expert for what concerns the integral 
above one GeV of this. But as you have seen, there are many channels. They have been analyzed in great details by comparing the different analysis, and there were some discrepancies, but <clears throat> none of the other channels is as important as pi plus pi minus. <clears throat> and here there is definitely a, an issue about the precision. So I think the comment by Alvaro at the beginning is appropriate. One could here take a very conservative approach and decide to, I don't know, double the uncertainty or so. Uh, I think we all know what this means and that giving this range is also reasonable, describes well the situation, but it could be that the actual uh, Yeah, that the actual final number is somewhere outside this band. So, I mean, just to give an example, you know, we have poll models, things like that, off shell behavior. I don't know, you know, is such a precise measurement now required that may be something that we inform factor in description that we have neglected? You know, is that possible or not? I know of all the things I mentioned, I don't think I hear anything which rings a bell to me. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> we have some more questions in the chat, Gilberto. I don't know whether yeah. you can see them. Uh, maybe I can. If not, I can read them for, for you. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so the two values of alpha m, I guess you, you mean the uh, determination based on the recoil of atoms. So that there is a discrepancy between the measurement done with uh, cesium and rubidium. Uh, I don't have any particular comment. That's uh, something to be understood. So I think that uh, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron is interesting and the determination of alpha, but none of this has any impact here. It's all below um, the uncertainties we see here. And now you say N and LO is surprisingly small. I don't think so. I think it's N and N, nine, no, N and LO, sorry. N and LO is surprisingly small. No, it's surprisingly large because you expect it goes with uh, a power of alpha, say reduction by 100. And this case is about right. In this case, it's only 10, but it's because of a, of a log which has been identified and pointed out by Matthias Steinhauser and company. Okay. I can I can ask a see. question? I cannot sure. raise my hand because sure. I'm co-host. Um, <laughs> yeah, first, thanks uh, for this uh, very interesting talk. May one, one comment from my side and one, one question. The comment is on the plus and minus data and possible differences. Overall, yes, there are visible differences, but I have seen much worse. And oh, yeah. uh, honestly, I don't see any reason why the data cannot be combined. And taking a conservative approach is already done in the black one, yeah? Uh, no, sorry, we, in, in the white paper one. Yeah, this is already quite conservative. Sure. So uh, just say, ah, this is uh, just uh, too different. And uh, so far we can't conclude anything. Uh, I think it's... Mm, it's, it's a bit too, too, too simple, yeah? Um, there were many people who put a lot of effort into this and therefore I think the, also the average here makes sense. And luckily we will have more data that will clarify the situation, yeah? Um, my question is more for the lattice data. I mean, the BMW result is out now for more than a year. And I would have expected that uh, other groups would uh, try to get to the same precision 
as quickly as possible? Or I guess that you have more insight. When can we really expect other groups uh, reaching the same level of precision there? I, I think this is key to understand what's going on. Yes, so to your comment here, I think that, I mean, yeah, I know if you look at um, lab data, for example, you, you have, I mean, uh, accelerator, the test of the standard model, you have this very long list of uh, observables and you expect a, a discrepancy somewhere, a pool somewhere. So if you compare two experiment or several experiment, you expect that somewhere there will be a discrepancy. I think that's also correct. It's true that in this case, it's really the two most precise one, ones that disagree. Wow. So, I mean, it's, it's we have a similar situation for the effective weak mixing angle, where both of them individually would exclude the standard model. <laughs> they have a discrepancy of three sigma, and only the average keeps the standard model alive. But okay, this is a different topic. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> now, concerning the lattice, I mean, yeah. uh, we are. I am in contact with uh, several people who are in different groups and working hard on this. Uh, they will not say. Of course, they're working all very hard. And I think uh, every year there is a deadline for the Lattice Conference. Uh, nobody has said that they will have an, a number for the Lattice Conference. Where it is. When is it this year? It's July. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be virtual, so you are I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> welcome to follow at least the session. Um, I've heard statements like before the end of the year window quantity with uh, uh, so coming back here. So one of the points which is made is that this value here is based on two different lattice spacing. So mm -hmm. one could say not quite at the same level of as this one. And they say they will have a third one and a precise, more precise number by the end of the year. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's difficult. I did not expect the, another light by light number until the day before it it appeared. <laughs> okay. Okay. But uh, the other groups are working on it. As you oh yes. Said. Oh yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. So there's Mainz, there is uh, Fermilab together with several others, <coughs> ETM, I'm sure, and maybe Carlos, you can help me. Well, for sure, the, the RBC UK QCD people will want RBC, to update yes, everything yes, right. apart from the window quantity. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, thanks a lot. I think in, a year from now, I mean, a, the new Fermilab result will will not come out before a year from now, I would say. So before the next experimental release, there will be definitely more lattice numbers for HVP. Okay. May, I, may I do a stupid comment but maybe useful to generate the thing to enlarge the error to reach uh, to value the pdg averaging uh, is okay but hides a fact a statistical fact which is important interesting in any case that at the end with time or generally only one of the two results is right not the average is the one who survives. Okay, uh, I think the discussion has been long already, so maybe it's a good point to, to conclude. Thank you very much again, Gilberto, for the, the excellent talk. Thank you talk all for having me. And the very useful discussion. Thank you. And see you all soon. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.